It's 1945 and a lunar aircraft roars through the sky searching for its target. Trolls is a young pilot, barely 19, and he is on a special mission. His nation is first and foremost in his mind, but he can't help but turn his thoughts towards his young bride waiting at home. Her photo is pinned to the instrument panel of his aircraft. Suddenly, up ahead looms the giant hulk of a warship, an enemy warship. And the young pilot steals himself and he lines his aircraft up on the target. Uh, in his mind, he has become a warrior of old, a hero of his homeland. His Zero fighter roars in at 300 miles per hour and there can be no turning back. During the Second World War, Japan's troops proved themselves to be a ferocious fighting force, driven by an intense desire to further their homeland's interests. But this just wasn't any old kind of nationalism, though. It was a deliberately manufactured mindset that the government had done its best to instill in all of its men. Now, it called back to Japan in the Middle Ages, when a tough breed of statesmen and warrior rose to lead states within the nation in an ever-evolving war of dominance. But who were these men, and how did they have so much influence in Japan? Hello, time travelers. My name is Michael Brady, and this is the true story of the lasting legacy of Japan's legendary warriors, the samurai. We all know their name. Over centuries, the word has passed into popular culture and myth. But who actually were the samurai? Where did the infamous samurai warrior spirit come from? And how was it used to encourage young men to sacrifice their lives so willingly all those years later during the Second World War? Well, to answer these questions, we have to turn the clock all the way back and find out where the samurai came from and how they evolved over centuries. In feudal Japan, they had originally formed a mixed warrior and ruling class, but they had descended from a much older class of public servant from all the way back in the 8th century. Feudal Japan, which ran roughly from the 7th century up until the late 1860s, was a very hierarchical society. Now let me try to distill it down. Now, the emperor and court nobility were theoretically on top and were the most highly respected positions in the country. And I say theoretically though, because they were powerless when compared to the shogun. Now, the shogun was the military dictator of Japan, and he was owed allegiance to by the daimyo class. Now, the daimyo were landowners who'd been passed great swathes of land down over generations, and it was to them that the samurai were assigned for protection. Now, the samurai were the next class down, and in return for their loyalty, the daimyo awarded samurai land in their domain, as well as salary of food or money. Now, these classes made up the Japanese nobility, while beneath the nobility and descending order of respect, with the peasants, the craftsmen, and finally the merchants. Now, interestingly, merchants were considered as the lowest of classes because they didn't actually produce anything themselves and only seemed to serve as a middleman between the craftsmen and their customers. Now, contrary to popular belief, the samurai weren't just warriors, but formed a landed nobility in their society, about the same as a medieval European knight. They were expected to serve their daimyo faithfully, following every order and sacrificing their life if necessary. Now, this way of life, all of the nuances and duties, was eventually organized into what has been called the Bushido Code, meaning the way of the warrior. While the Bushido Code was set down as the blueprint for a samurai's way of life, it was not set in concrete. It changed and evolved from the 1600s on, as Japan itself changed and soon it evolved into something unique and terrifying, giving the samurai immense power. Despite Japan having an emperor that was recognized by all, the daimyo kind of functioned as their own individual statesmen, fighting wars amongst themselves. Until the Edo period began in 1600 and the country finally became united under a shogun, there was never a shortage of battles for the samurai to fight. From the mid 15th century until 1600, Japan was in a state of constant warfare between the different regional daimyo. In these wars, the Japanese social system was far less entrenched than it would eventually become, allowing samurai to rise through social ranks through merit, or even overthrowing their superiors. And in this way, many of the daimyo were established as rulers. Now, Christianity began to arrive in Japan in the 16th century through Portuguese missionaries, and quickly established a foothold. Now, these efforts were particularly successful on the most southern of Japan's largest island, Kyushu, where several independent daimyo were converted to Christianity who in turn converted their samurai beneath them. 
Now, the religious fervor quickly led to the destruction of Buddhist and Shinto shrines in the region as part of the warfare conducted between the newly converted lords and those who were still following Japan's traditional belief system. Now, it might seem strange that newly arrived missionaries would be so easily able to convert high-ranking members of the nobility and establish a religion that had no historical presence in the region. But at this point in Japanese history, the island had been subject to civil war for so long that anything that could provide an advantage was seen as being on the cards. Which brings us to the next point. Being a Christian offered trade advantages with foreign powers, such as allowing access to gunpowder and weaponry. Prior to the unification of Japan under the Shogun, being a samurai meant a near constant fight for survival in the many wars being fought and scrambling for any advantage that might be afforded to your side. Now this included joining with foreigners and their religion, if that's what your lord ordered you to do. Now, despite the reputation for honourable conduct and the strict code of honour that the samurai followed, they were fundamentally mercenaries that did whatever it took to win. Now, this all changed in 1600 when the shogun managed to take power in the country and united the many daimyo under his rule. An era of peace began that would last for centuries and dramatically change the role of the samurai. And much bigger changes were to come though. Before the 1630s, Japan engaged in much the same trade and maritime activities as the rest of the world. But in that decade, a series of edicts were issued by the shogun that would close Japan almost entirely off from the rest of the world. These policies were collectively known as Sokoku, and they restricted trade with most foreign powers, as well as forbidding Japanese people from leaving the country under penalty of death. Now, the samurai in Japan itself would enter a period of peace that would last until the 1860s. And from this point, culture rather than warfare flourished among the samurai. But this couldn't last forever. As with the rest of the world, technology and modernization were soon to catch up with Japan and the samurai. Spanish missionary Francis Xavier arrived in Japan in the mid 16th century and was immediately impressed with the cultivated lifestyle practiced by the samurai. Literacy was common for both men and women, with poetry and gardening being especially popular pastimes for the elite. Now Xavier wrote back to Europe that the samurai sent their children to monasteries from the age of 8 to 18, where they would learn literacy and religion before graduating and applying themselves to politics and marriage. He called them discreet, magnanimous, and lovers of virtue and letters. Now that being said, they were first and foremost a military class, so fighting and training took up large portions of their time. And from childhood, both male and female samurai children were taught martial arts and swordsmanship. The men practiced so they would always be ready for war, and women so they would be able to defend their home in case the men were away fighting. Now the samurai's status and power had grown to immense proportions. During the Edo period, to treat a samurai with disrespect could result in immediate death for whoever it was that had insulted the warrior. They had the right to kill members of the lower classes that had insulted them as part of a practice called Kiri Sute Gomen. There were strict rules around this. The killer blow had to be delivered in one hit immediately after the offense, and the samurai would have to immediately report the incident to a government official. Now, at the same time, there were also restrictions that had been placed on the samurai. They were forbidden from taking part in commerce and trade, as it was seen as being beneath their social status. Now, a policy of death before dishonor was also implemented. Seppuku, a ritual disembowelment, was practiced by the samurai who felt that they had been dishonored or had failed a task. Now, in a seppuku ceremony, a samurai would stab themselves in the stomach with their own blade and pull a cross, slicing their belly open, while a second would stand overhead ready to decapitate the victim after their blade had been pulled. Now, this could be ordered by a superior officer or if a samurai had shamed themselves through bad conduct, but was more common as a means of honorable death after a defeat in battle. Now, it was considered shameful to lose a battle and be taken prisoner, but by seppuku, the samurai could keep their honor. Now, in Japan, only samurai and members of the upper classes had the right to carry weapons. And they were awarded two swords that they always carried on the left side as a marker of their class. Despite the prosperity of the Edo period, all was not well. Between the country being closed in the 1630s and the country opening up again in the 1850s, the population of Japan had roughly doubled. 
On top of this, the urban population had absolutely exploded. And the capital city, Edo's population had increased drastically from 100,000 in 1600 to over 1 million in just 250 years. Now, this increase in population and urbanization was causing social unrest even before the opening of the country. The new concentration of people in urban areas had catapulted the wealth of the merchant class, despite them being originally considered as the lowest of the social classes. And by contrast, the lands of samurai weren't heavily taxed, and this began to reduce the income of the ruling class. And this social tension came to a head in 1853, when an American fleet under the command of Admiral Matthew Perry sailed into Edo, which is now Tokyo Harbour, and demanded that Japan open themselves up to the rest of the world. Although the country was closed to most, in certain ports, trade with the Dutch remained open, particularly for the importing of weaponry. Now, the samurai had been using gunpowder weaponry for far before Admiral Perry's expedition made land, but the arrival of this new fleet had huge other ramifications. It meant that Japan would lose the ability to regulate its own trade and would be forced to accept whatever provisions were forced upon it by the West. Now, seeing the superiority of the American fleet, and knowing what had happened to China when it had attempted to resist Western powers in the Opium Wars, and that's definitely a story for another time, the Shogun reluctantly accepted the unequal treaties forced upon them by America, and later by other Western powers. Now, the daimyo and the samurai were badly disillusioned by this enormous change to Japanese society. And this was a group of people who had been practicing an intense and ritualistic way of life for centuries. Now, it all felt like it was coming to an end. The Shogun finally lost the loyalty of the daimyo, who rallied around the emperor instead. The tensions were too much, and a brutal civil war broke out as the daimyo rebelled against the Shogun. Even as the Shogun tried to modernize his armies with Western help, the combined forces of the daimyo proved too much, and at the decisive four-day battle of Toba Fushimi, the Shogun's rule was ended. Now, the 15-year-old emperor, Maiji, became the true head of Japan, no longer just a figurehead. Now, thus began the period of Japanese modernization that would dominate the remainder of the 19th century and completely transform Japanese society from the ground up. When the American expedition reached the shores of Japan in 1853, it became apparent just how far behind Japan was when compared to the rest of the world. The samurai split into two groups, those who wished to preserve the shogun and retain what they considered to be Japan's natural state, and those who wished to modernize and enter the new world. The new Japanese government quickly found that an elite military caste was not suited to the challenges of the modern world, and that a reformation of the army would be required if Japan was to keep its independence in the face of all those Western empires at their doorstep. Field Marshal Yamagata Aritomo introduced conscription for all Japanese men over 20 years old, regardless of social class. Now, the army was no longer the sole domain of the samurai, but had become a national institution. On top of this, loyalty to the regional daimyo began to be seen as outdated and divisive. Uh, efforts were made to ensure the soldiers and Japanese society as a whole were not connected simply to a region, but felt loyalty towards the emperor and the entire unified country. The Japanese government also began a series of industrialization projects, building factories and railways all across the islands that dramatically changed the economy. Now, the payments that had previously been given to the samurai by their lords also stopped as the new government didn't feel that there was any point in continuing to supply that class with money. In 1876, the government went so far as to ban the carrying of swords, which has been a marker of the samurai class for centuries. Now, this tension between the samurai and the new Japanese government culminated in the Satsuma Rebellion of 1877. Saigo Takamori was a samurai who had originally supported the rise of the emperor, but by 1877 he was uncomfortable with the direction that the Japanese nation was taking. He saw industrialization and the adoption of Western culture as a deep betrayal of the Japanese way of life, and he began setting up paramilitary groups led by samurai in the Satsuma region in violation of the government's ban on weapons. When the newly formed Japanese Imperial Army was sent to disarm the groups, Takamori found himself leading a samurai rebellion against the government. Now, once the Tokyo government had mobilized, however, it quickly became clear just how outdated the samurai were in New Japan. There were around 30,000 samurai at Takamori's command, armed with traditional swords and spears, supplemented with antiquated gunpowder guns that had been in Japan for centuries. 
Now, the Imperial Army, however, was able to mobilize over 200,000 conscripts armed with the latest in Western weaponry, including artillery and machine guns. And the result was a massacre of the samurai. Of the major battles fought in the rebellion, not a single one was a samurai victory. And less than a year after the rebellion had begun, Takamori's forces had been reduced to just a few hundred men, and he performed seppuku to avoid capture. The last of the samurai with him chose to charge the Imperial Army lines in a hopeless attack as a last wild gesture of defiance and they were gunned down with ease. With this, the last of the samurai were defeated and Japan's modern era had truly begun. This marked the end of the traditional samurai way of life, and those remaining alive fairly quickly adapted to the new order, taking new roles in a society that was rapidly changing to meet the challenges of a new age. Mori Aranori, for example, was from a samurai family and was the first minister of education in Japanese history, serving beforehand as ambassador to various nations. And though he was descended of samurai, he could be seen as one of those more radical reformists in the Japanese government, he was a converted Christian and went so far as to suggest the abolition of the Japanese language in favour of English. Now, this sounds insane today, but it just reflects how deeply concerned the samurai and all of Japanese society was when faced with the prospect of other powers being so obviously capable of conquering them. And in a way, the word Western became a code word for modernity, and what had been Japanese became outdated and weak. This cultural self-hate wouldn't last, of course, but in the early days it contributed significantly to the destruction of the traditional samurai way of living. Now, despite the massive changes, some traditional elements remained. Devotion to a master changed from the daimyo to the emperor, and it did not disappear. Now, the Bushido Code itself was first adapted and then adopted by the new conscript army, modified for its new role in an army of common people rather than nobility. In terms of the absolute devotion to a master and a sense of honour that must never be infringed upon, it was not until after the Second World War that the Bushido Code was truly rendered obsolete. And believe it or not, the samurai themselves never truly went extinct. The social classes might have been abolished and the ways of living changed, but the samurai families have maintained their influence in Japanese society even to the modern day. A recent BBC article described the situation thus. In 1868, the samurai surrendered their swords, cut their hair, put on western suits and marched into the ministries, and they're still there today. The samurai families continue to dominate politically and economically within the country. In fact, Shinzo Abe, who was Japan's longest serving prime minister, was actually descended of samurai. So it was that in the 20th century, though the samurai might have been abolished, their influence continued to be felt through much of Japanese culture. In much the same way, medieval knights were looked upon in Europe as an idealized culture that upheld chivalry and all things that were good, the samurai came to be seen as a symbol of Japanese strength and pride. Now, this became especially true during the Second World War, when the entirety of Japanese society was mobilized and taught absolute devotion to the emperor, even unto death. Now, in fact, the emperor was seen as a kind of deity, and the whole royal family was considered holy. Now, their preservation and the protection of Japan was of the utmost importance, and virtually the entire nation rallied behind this ideal. Now this brings us back to our young pilot, now, probably the most famous implementation of the Bushido code of self-sacrifice after the modernization of Japan was by the kamikaze pilots. Now, Japan had entered the Second World War confident it could defeat the United States and the British, but American production had proved just too much. By 1944 and 1945, late in the war, America's warship sailed almost with impunity as Japan's navy sat mostly at the bottom of the ocean. And defeat bred desperation. The enemy would have to be stopped at all costs. Government propaganda specifically cited Bushido and the old warrior spirit to call on young men to do something radical. They could never sink American warships en masse with bombs or rockets. It might take dozens of bombs and torpedoes to sink just one battleship but a fully laden aeroplane loaded with explosives could prove a killer blow. And the kamikaze were born, instructed to fly their aircraft directly into American warships and sink them. They would be hailed as the new heroes of Japan and the newest incarnation of the loyal samurai. 
Now, the effect was not enough to change the tide of the war, but they had an intense psychological effect on the Americans and the rest of the world, who looked with shock and horror as Japanese fighter aircraft and bombers began to be flown deliberately into the decks of Allied warships in droves. The effect was tremendous. Thousands of Allied sailors and airmen were killed by waves of kamikaze attacks, and over 30 ships were sunk. Now, this loss of men and materiel was, to American leadership, kind of to be expected. The sheer fighting will of the Japanese soldier was impossible to ignore. The Japanese generals of the time hoped that such intense devotion would be able to overcome the enemy's numerical and material superiority. And this was stated directly by General Kawabe, commander of the kamikaze pilots, while addressing the American Commission of Inquiry after the war. He explained that, right up until the end, we believed we could outweigh your material and scientific superiority by the force of our moral and spiritual convictions. Now, the Code of Bushido might have originated with the samurai, but by the Second World War, it was permeated throughout all of Japanese society. The kamikaze pilots were, by and large, not the fanatical descendants of samurai themselves, but were often well-educated students who did what they felt to be their duty to Japan. In Ryuji Nagatsuka's book, I Was a Kamikaze, he wrote of the internal conflict felt by himself and his companions when faced with the prospect of a kamikaze attack. He said, I was longing to go back to my studies. I was unconsciously hoping to be demobilized while in my conscious mind, I was determined to offer up my life in the service of my country. More tragically than pilots willingly sacrificing themselves was the events on the island of Saipan, when over 1,000 civilians chose to jump off the island's cliffs rather than be captured by American forces. When it became clear that the war was going to be lost, the entire population of the Japanese mainland was mobilized to fight off an invasion, with millions being armed with little more than sharpened sticks. The Japanese military government had taken the code of no surrender to heart and was perfectly prepared to sacrifice the entire country if that's what it took. Now finally, in August 1945, Emperor Hirohito made the decision after months of intense firebombing and the dropping of two nuclear bombs that surrender was Japan's only option if it was to ever exist into the future. He spoke on radio, the first time the Japanese people had ever heard their holy emperor's voice. Japan would finally surrender to the enemy. And even after hearing the emperor himself give the order to lay down their arms, there was an attempted coup from the army to prevent that surrender. And that's how deeply ingrained the code of Bushido had become in the society. Despite the samurai being abolished long before the Second World War, the Bushido code has survived and still influences much of Japanese society to one extent or another to this day. Now, famous author Yukio Mishima adhered to the lifestyle of samurai to the point that in the 1970s, he attempted to stage a coup to restore the emperor to power and rebuild the empire of Japan. Now, this failed catastrophically, and he was even heckled by the very soldiers he attempted to rally, but it shows that even in the 1970s, the samurai spirit was alive and well. Hello time travelers, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, leave a comment below, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, remember, history doesn't repeat, but it certainly echoes.